Chapter 2 When we were children, Hassan and I used to climb the poplar trees in the driveway of my father's house and annoy our neighbours by reflecting sunlight into their homes with a shard of mirror. We would sit across from each other on a pair of high branches, our naked feet dangling, our trouser pockets filled with dried mulberries and walnuts. We took turns with the mirror as we ate mulberries, pelted each other with them, giggling, laughing. I can still see Hassan up on that tree, sunlight flickering through the leaves on his almost perfectly round face, a face like a Chinese doll chiseled from hardwood, his flat, broad nose and slanting, narrow eyes like bamboo leaves, eyes that looked, depending on the light, gold, green, even sapphire. I can still see his tiny, low-set ears and that pointed stub of a chin, a meaty appendage that looked like it was added as a mere afterthought. And the cleft lip, just left of midline, where the Chinese dollmaker's instrument may have slipped, or perhaps he had simply grown tired and careless. Sometimes, up in those trees, I talked Hassan into firing walnuts with his slingshot at the neighbor's one-eyed German shepherd. Hassan never wanted to, but if I asked, really asked, he wouldn't deny me. Hassan never denied me anything, and he was deadly with his slingshot. Hassan's father, Ali, used to catch us and get mad, or as mad as someone as gentle as Ali could ever get. He would wag his finger and wave us down from the tree. He would take the mirror and tell us what his mother had told him, that the devil shone mirrors too, shone them to distract Muslims during prayer. And he laughs while he does it, he always added, scowling at his son. Yes, father, Hassan would mumble, looking down at his feet. But he never told on me. Never told that the mirror, like shooting walnuts at the neighbor's dog, was always my idea. The poplar trees lined the red brick driveway, which led to a pair of wrought iron gates. They, in turn, opened into an extension of the driveway into my father's estate. The house sat on the left side of the brick path, the backyard at the end of it. Everyone agreed that my father, my Baba, had built the most beautiful house in the Wazir Akbar Khan district, a new and affluent neighborhood in the northern part of Kabul. Some thought it was the prettiest house in all of Kabul. A broad entryway flanked by rose bushes led to the sprawling house of marble floors and wide windows. Intricate mosaic tiles, hand-picked by Baba in Isfahan, covered the floors of the four bathrooms. Gold-stitched tapestries, which Baba had bought in Calcutta, lined the walls. A crystal chandelier hung from the vaulted ceiling. Upstairs was my bedroom, Baba's room, and his study, also known as the smoking room, which perpetually smelled of tobacco and cinnamon. Baba and his friends reclined on black leather chairs there after Ali had served dinner. They stuffed their pipes, except Baba always called it fattening the pipe, and discussed their favourite three topics. Politics, business, soccer. Sometimes I asked Baba if I could sit with them, but Baba would stand in the doorway. Go on now, he'd say. This is grown-up's time. Why don't you go read one of those books of yours? He'd close the door, leave me to wonder why it was always grown-up's time with him. I'd sit by the door, knees drawn to my chest, Sometimes I sat there for an hour, sometimes two, listening to their laughter, their chatter. The living room downstairs had a curved wall with custom-built cabinets. Inside sat framed family pictures. An old grainy photo of my grandfather and King Nadir Shah, taken in 1931, two years before the king's assassination. They are standing over a dead deer, dressed in knee-high boots, rifles slung over their shoulders. There was a picture of my parents' wedding night, Baba dashing in his black suit, and my mother a smiling young princess in white. Here was Baba and his best friend and business partner, Rahim Khan, standing outside our house, neither one smiling. I am a baby in that photograph, and Baba is holding me, looking tired and grim. I'm in his arms, but it's Rahim Khan's pinky my fingers are curled around. The curved wall led into the dining room, at the centre of which was a mahogany table that could easily sit thirty guests, 
and given my father's taste for extravagant parties, it did just that almost every week. On the other end of the dining room was a tall marble fireplace, always lit by the orange glow of a fire in the winter time. A large sliding glass door opened into a semicircular terrace that overlooked two acres of backyard and rows of cherry trees. Baba and Ali had planted a small vegetable garden along the eastern wall. Tomatoes, mint, peppers, and a row of corn that never really took. Hassan and I used to call it the Wall of Ailing Corn. On the south end of the garden, in the shadows of a loquat tree, was the servant's home, a modest little hut where Hassan lived with his father. It was there, in that little shack, that Hassan was born in the winter of 1964, just one year after my mother died giving birth to me. In the eighteen years that I lived in that house, I stepped into Hassan and Ali's quarters only a handful of times. When the sun dropped low behind the hills and we were done playing for the day, Hassan and I parted ways. I went past the rose bushes to Baba's mansion, Hassan to the mud shack where he had been born, where he had lived his entire life. I remember it was spare, clean, dimly lit by a pair of kerosene lamps. There were two mattresses on opposite sides of the room, a worn Herati rug with frayed edges in between, a three-legged stool and a wooden table in the corner where Hassan did his drawings. The wall stood bare, save for a single tapestry with sewn-in beads forming the words Allah ul akbar Baba had bought it for Ali on one of his trips to Mashhad. It was in that small shack that Hassan's mother, Sanobar, gave birth to him one cold winter day in 1964. While my mother hemorrhaged to death during childbirth, Hassan lost his less than a week after he was born. Lost her to a fate most Afghans considered far worse than death. She ran off with a clan of travelling singers and dancers. Hassan never talked about his mother, as if she had never existed. I always wondered if he dreamed about her about what she looked like, where she was. I wondered if he longed to meet her. Did he ache for her the way I ached for the mother I had never met? One day, we were walking from my father's house to Cinema Zainab for a new Iranian movie, taking the shortcut through the military barracks near Istiklal Middle School. Baba had forbidden us to take that shortcut, but he was in Pakistan with Rahim Khan at the time. We hopped the fence that surrounded the barracks, slipped over a little creek, and broke into the open dirt field where old abandoned tanks collected dust. A group of soldiers huddled in the shade of one of those tanks, smoking cigarettes and playing cards. One of them saw us, elbowed the guy next to him, and called Hassan. Hey, you! he said. I know you! We had never seen him before. He was a squatty man with a shaved head and black stubble on his face. The way he grinned at us, leered, scared me. Just keep walking, I muttered to Hassan. You, the Hazara! Look at me when I'm talking to you, the soldier barked. He handed his cigarette to the guy next to him, made a circle with the thumb and index finger of one hand, poked the middle finger of his other hand through the circle, poked it in and out, in and out. I knew your mother! Did you know that? I knew her real good. I took her from behind by that creek over there. The soldiers laughed. One of them made a squealing sound. I told her son to keep walking, keep walking. What a tight little sugary cunt she had, the soldier was saying, shaking hands with the others, grinning. Later in the dark, after the movie had started, I heard her son next to me, croaking. Tears were sliding down his cheeks. I reached across my seat, slung my arm around him, pulled him close. He rested his head on my shoulder. He took you for someone else, I whispered. He took you for someone else. I'm told no one was really surprised when Sanobar eloped. People had raised their eyebrows when Ali, a man who had memorized the Quran, married Sanobar, a woman nineteen years younger, a beautiful but notoriously unscrupulous woman who lived up to her dishonorable reputation. 
Like Ali, she was a Shia Muslim and an ethnic Hazara. She was also his first cousin, and therefore a natural choice for a spouse. But beyond these similarities, Ali and Sanobar had little in common, least of all their respective appearances. While Sanobar's brilliant green eyes and impish face had, rumour has it, tempted countless men into sin, Ali had a congenital paralysis of his lower facial muscles, a condition that rendered him unable to smile and left him perpetually grim-faced. It was an odd thing to see the stone-faced Ali happy or sad, because only his slanted brown eyes glinted with a smile or welled with sorrow. People say that eyes are windows to the soul. Never was that more true than with Ali, who could only reveal himself through his eyes. I have heard that Sanobar's suggestive stride and oscillating hips sent men to reveries of infidelity. But polio had left Ali with a twisted, atrophied right leg that was sallow skin over bone with little in between except a paper-thin layer of muscle. I remember one day when I was eight, Ali was taking me to the bazaar to buy some naan. I was walking behind him, humming, trying to imitate his walk. I watched him swing his scraggy leg in a sweeping arc, watched his whole body tilt impossibly to the right every time he planted that foot. It seemed a minor miracle he didn't tip over with each step. When I tried it, I almost fell into the gutter. That got me giggling. Ali turned round, caught me aping him. He didn't say anything. Not then, not ever. He just kept walking. Ali's face and his walk frightened some of the younger children in the neighbourhood. But the real trouble was with the older kids. They chased him on the street and mocked him when he hobbled by. Some had taken to calling him Babalu or Boogeyman. Hey, Babalu, who did you eat today? They barked to a chorus of laughter. Who did you eat, you flat-nosed Babalu? They called him flat-nosed because of Ali and Hassan's characteristic Hazara mongoloid features. For years, that was all I knew about the Hazaras, that they were Mughal descendants and that they looked a little like Chinese people. School textbooks barely mentioned them and referred to their ancestry only in passing. Then one day, I was in Baba's study, looking through his stuff, when I found one of my mother's old history books. It was written by an Iranian named Khorami. I blew the dust off it, sneaked it into bed with me that night, and was stunned to find an entire chapter on Hazara history, an entire chapter dedicated to Hassan's people. In it, I read that my people, the Pashtuns, had persecuted and oppressed the Hazaras. It said the Hazaras had tried to rise against the Pashtuns in the 19th century, but the Pashtuns had quelled them with unspeakable violence. The book said that my people had killed the Hazaras, driven them from their lands, burned their homes and sold their women. The book said part of the reason Pashtuns had oppressed the Hazaras was that Pashtuns were Sunni Muslims, while Hazaras were Shia. The book said a lot of things I didn't know. Things my teachers hadn't mentioned. Things Baba hadn't mentioned either. It also said some things I did know, like that people called Hazaras mice-eating, flat-nosed, load-carrying donkeys. I had heard some of the kids in the neighbourhood yell those names to Hassan. The following week, after class, I showed the book to my teacher and pointed to the chapter on the Hazaras. He skimmed through a couple of pages, snickered, handed the book back. That's the one thing Shia people do well, he said, picking up his papers. Passing themselves as martyrs. He wrinkled his nose when he said the word Shia, like it was some kind of disease. But, despite sharing ethnic heritage and family blood, Sanobar joined the neighbourhood kids in taunting Ali. I have heard that she made no secret of her disdain for his appearance. This is a husband, she would sneer. I have seen old donkeys better suited to be a husband. In the end, most people suspected the marriage had been an arrangement of sorts between Ali and his uncle, Sanobar's father. 
They said Ali had married his cousin to help restore some honour to his uncle's blemished name, even though Ali, who had been orphaned at the age of five, had no worldly possessions or inheritance to speak of. Ali never retaliated against any of his tormentors. I suppose partly because he could never catch them with that twisted leg dragging behind him, but mostly because Ali was immune to the insults of his assailants. He had found his joy, his antidote, the moment Sanobar had given birth to Hassan. It had been a simple enough affair. No obstetricians, no anesthesiologists, no fancy monitoring devices. Just Sanobar lying on a stained naked mattress with Ali and a midwife helping her. She hadn't needed much help at all, because even in birth Hassan was true to his nature. He was incapable of hurting anyone. A few grunts, a couple of pushes, and out came Hassan. Out he came, smiling. As confided to a neighbor's servant by the garrulous midwife, who had then in turn told anyone who would listen, Sanobar had taken one glance at the baby in Ali's arms, seen the cleft lip, and barked a bitter laughter. There, she had said, now you have your own idiot child to do all your smiling for you. She had refused to even hold her son, and, just five days later, she was gone. Baba hired the same nursing woman who had fed me to nurse her son. Ali told us she was a blue-eyed Hasara woman from Bamiyan, the city of the giant Buddha statues. What a sweet singing voice she had, he used to say to us. What did she sing, Hassan and I always asked, though we already knew. Ali had told us countless times. We just wanted to hear Ali sing. He'd clear his throat and begin. On a high mountain I stood and cried the name of Ali, Lion of God. O oh, Ali, Lion of God, King of Men, bring joy to our sorrowful hearts. Then he would remind us that there was a brotherhood between people who had fed from the same breast, a kinship that not even time could break. Hassan and I fed from the same breasts. We took our first steps on the same lawn in the same yard, and, under the same roof, we spoke our first words. Mine was Baba, his was Amir, my name. Looking back on it now, I think the foundation for what happened in the winter of 1975, and all that followed, was already laid in those first words.